Welcome back. Joe Brunsman here, insurance broker to the stars. And today we're going to be talking about those cyber risks and cyber insurance considerations specifically for people in the manufacturing industry. So let's go ahead and jump on into it. All right. First, it's helpful to know, okay, who are the perpetrators? So that's not necessarily to say who's coming after you, but who are the perpetrators? Who are the people that are responsible for these cyber events or data breaches occurring at manufacturing companies? Well, I dug through about 20 or so different studies, everything I could get my hands on to try and figure out where this is coming from. And it turns out that about three quarters of those are going to be external actors. So there's really no surprise there that criminals from all over the country or all over the world could be trying to get into your system. What is kind of surprising is that about a quarter of those are going to be internal actors. And we're going to be talking about some easy ways that you can try and minimize your risk in that particular area. And then about 1% are going to be partner breaches. Now, briefly, what is a partner breach? A partner breach is some other business that has access to your network. A criminal gains access to that partner and thereby gains access to your network. Uh, a great example of that would be the JP Morgan uh, breach that occurred a few years ago where they went in through vendor credentials to actually hack into the system, despite JP Morgan spending something like a quarter billion a year on cybersecurity. All right, so why are they actually going after manufacturers? Why is it becoming really difficult to get cyber insurance policies for manufacturers? Well, you know, interestingly, you guys don't have a lot of PII, PHI, or PCI, or really any meaningful density thereof. So unlike somebody who could be a hospital or an accounting firm or some sort of retailer that could have a large density of that type of information, you guys as manufacturers, you don't really have that. What you do have is money, um, and not necessarily money internally in terms of revenue, but money that you could be sending out to various partners or vendors, et cetera, or people sending money to you. So about three quarters of the reason they're coming after you is for some sort of financial gain. The other 25%, so about one quarter, is your competition trying to get into your systems to figure out what you're doing and how you're doing it, or some sort of nation state that's coming after you. So if you're in the manufacturing industry, I'm sure that the acronym CMMC is very familiar to you, or hopefully it should be. And that is one of the reasons why. It's these nation states trying to come after manufacturers to figure out how they're doing it, what they're doing it, and trying to steal that intellectual property that you guys have inside of your business there. All right, now what prevalent methods are they actually using? So we talked about, okay, who's coming after you? Why are they doing it? Let's talk about how they're doing it. So primarily, now I will say that there's a million different ways that they can skin this cap, but we're trying to go for, hey, what are the highest probability methods of intrusion that they're trying to use? So first is going to be crimeware. So using some sort of identity theft through social engineering to gain access to your system. An easy example of that would be some sort of business email compromise event. Two would be web applications. So that's used as a gateway to your databases, which could contain some sort of sensitive information, which could be... Um, intellectual property is a great example there. And then privilege abuse and misuse. That goes back to that quarter that are internal actors. So that's inappropriate or fraudulent activity. And that could be either malicious or accidental. So it could be somebody going into your system because they're angry at your business and they're going to sell that intellectual property to a competitor of yours. It could be an employee who's angry because he thinks he's going to get laid off, so he's just going to burn the house down on his way out. Or it could just be somebody who they have access to systems that they just simply don't need access for, and they accidentally do something wrong. They start playing around. They think it's cool. They start looking at what they have access to, and then all of a sudden, you got a big problem on your hands. So what are those threats to your business? So if you boil all this down, what are the threats to your business? And this will become important for both the cybersecurity side as well as the cyber insurance side. And here's what it actually comes down to. So this is, you know, of course, going back to those 20 some different studies, as well as my own personal experience providing cyber insurance and some element of cybersecurity consulting um, on a fundamental level to those manufacturers. So, of course, payment fraud, wire fraud, social engineering, trying to get you to send money to places that it should not be going. Some sort of nation state actors and espionage, we talked about that. Uh, 
10x that if you're manufacturing for the military or the government and you fall under the auspices of CMMC. Of course, the downtime business interruption. Um, you, you know, if you're like, let's say, an accounting firm and you have business interruption reimbursement coverage on your cyber policy, well, unless you're actually down for a really long time, it's kind of hard to evidence that and prove that you had a loss there because a lot of that work, you know, it's pencil and paper, bean counter kind of stuff. And, you know, you could always make up that work sometime later down the road with a few exceptions, unless you're down for a really long time. In the manufacturing industry, hey, if it's you couldn't make this widget, therefore this widget didn't sell, therefore you're out X amount of dollars, a little bit easier to actually evidence that loss. Obviously, ransomware, which is crushing everybody, um, that just really affects everybody that has a computer system. So if you have a computer system, if you have a network, you are subject to ransomware. That, of course, ties into the business interruption. But suffice to say, probably not a path you want to go down. Intellectual property theft, we talked about that. Supply chain attacks and Internet of Thing attacks. So that could be you have something that's connected to the Internet, whether it's some type of machine or it's your thermostat, everything in between. They're attacking those systems, gaining access to your network or potentially destroying things. So there's actually a, a fairly famous case. I believe it was out in Germany. It's inside of my book, which you can get a link to later. And it was actually some, I believe it was like a teenage kid actually hacked into a smelting plant and did like millions of dollars of damage because he just starts playing around with all these industrial control systems. And he thinks it's fun and great on the other side of a computer. Whereas that business, that smelting plant, I mean, that could have killed people that obviously did millions of dollars worth of damage. And that was a bad day and had far reaching consequences outside of that. So let's talk about some of those fundamental controls and recommendations uh, that I think that manufacturing companies should really take a look at. And obviously, this is in light of those common threats that we saw earlier. So number one is going to be defense in depth. Um, you know, there is no magic bullet, unfortunately. There is no one thing you can do that's going to prevent all cybersecurity events that could occur inside of your business there. Unfortunately, it's just not that simple. Um, if we're going to actually drill down and focus on a few within that defense in depth category, these are what I think you should look at. CSC 12, that's boundary defense. CSC 17, security awareness training, absolutely crucial. And CSC 13, data protection. That data protection is really going to deal with that one quarter internal threat issue that we've been talking about. And of course, this is all available uh, for free if you really want to dig into these a little bit further than what I'm talking about here at the link below. So let's talk about that boundary defense. What is that? Well, it's a list. I'm not going to explain what all of these things are. Obviously, you should talk to your IT or your MSP about these, but firewalls, proxies, DMZ network perimeters, um, incident prevention systems and incident detection systems. Generally, those are now packaged together in something called an IPDS. Filtering inbound and outbound traffic, just make sure you know what's coming in, what's going out. Security awareness training. Uh, I have two entire videos. I will link the description above here so you can go back and watch it or you can just comb through my other videos after this presentation. But suffice to say, if I was going to boil it down in like a little 30 second tidbit, it would be the following. Humans are great at recognizing patterns. And the more that we can subject humans to seeing those patterns, the better they are going to be to counter those threats. So at the end of the day, when all is said and done, the technology we have at our disposal is only so good. And that technology is also available to the bad guys. They know what we're using. With that, the human is often the last layer of defense that you have. And if you look at a lot of the loss cases, the ones that I've seen internally for manufacturing, uh, clients of mine, as well as all the ones you can find out there in the world. A lot of it eventually just comes down to a human made the decision, unfortunately, to do something that they were not supposed to do. And that's what's really going to burn your business. Security awareness training of all these basic controls we're talking about, it's relatively affordable, um, shouldn't be brank in the bank there. And very, very useful. Highly encourage everybody watching this to consider reaching out and getting that cybersecurity awareness training going on. Don't just do it once a year. That's probably not going to be enough for you. Think about doing it at least once a month. It can be short little tutorials. That's totally fine. But just make sure that you're getting the latest and greatest on all the newest threats that are going on. 
Now, being in this industry and specifically a cyber insurance broker and an E&O broker, you know, uh, I really thought I had seen everything. I'm also a former IT. I have a bachelor's in robotics and a master's in cybersecurity law. I thought I pretty much knew all of the ways that they could fool people. But nonetheless, every month something new pops up where I'm surprised that some bad guy thought of that. So make sure you're staying up to date there. All right, now let's talk about that data protection. This really gets into that internal threat actor to a large degree. Now, this is not as simple as just buying something and plugging it in, as it were, into your cybersecurity system. This takes a lot more thought and a lot more effort to really do this right, but it's definitely worth your time to go down this path. So you have to think about looking at your system, the information you have, what is actually critical? What is sensitive? What is that information that if it got out into the world, you could be in trouble there? Where is that information actually located on your system? Do you even know where it's located? And think about it this way. If you have a castle, that's great. But if your treasure is outside the castle, the castle is not doing you a lot of good. So you really want to know, okay, where's the treasure room inside of the castle? Maybe we should post some extra guards there. Maybe it needs a thicker door. I think the analogy kind of proves out. But suffice to say, you just need to be thinking about, okay, where is this information? Who needs access to it? And likewise, who does not need access to it? And a lot of that is going to just limit the spread of potential malware when you start locking down and segmenting your systems. Also, you can classify that data. So that could be confidential information, it could be public information, however you want to parse that out is up to you, but make sure that the employees and fellow management actually understands, okay, is this information that has to be protected because it's crucial information like intellectual property? How do you mark that? Now, as a former naval officer myself, we do all this stuff all the time, Uh, but once you kind of get into the flow of it, it's actually quite easy. All right, make sure that you're going to inventory your data, make sure you understand what you have, And then segment that crucial data. That's what I was talking about before. If you need to post extra guards, if you need a thicker wall to the treasure room there, make sure that you're actually getting that done. And then obviously just control access to that segment. So what does that really mean? That just means that those guards, so in our analogy here, that would be uh, either through security awareness training or your own personnel or some type of cybersecurity control, that it actually knows who is allowed to gain access to that treasure room, who is not allowed to gain access to that treasure room. And ideally, the list of those allowed is going to be a lot shorter um, than those that are not allowed. So make sure you're taking that seriously. Now, let's look at some of those existing insurance issues. Now, I am not a general insurance guy. Like I said before, I work specifically on the E&O and the cyber side, uh, but I know enough to be dangerous on the commercial general liability side. And these are kind of two places I think you should begin to look if you were speaking with your own general insurance guy about trying to cover some type of uh, cyber insurance or cyber event loss that could occur inside your manufacturing business. And that would be equipment breakdown coverage and CP1030 special cause of loss. I cannot cover every single potential endorsement that's on a policy. I cannot cover every potential change to a policy form that you guys potentially have, but these are two good places to look. So what is that equipment breakdown coverage? You'll just see an example of it here. I believe this is an ISO form. A lot of these are pretty similar with maybe minor differences there, but you can pause the video here and kind of scroll through that, but it really gets down into some sort of equipment breakdown coverage. Now I will say What I have seen from other manufacturers looking at their general liability policies, there's going to be an exclusion in there or the wording does not really lend itself to dealing with some type of data breach or cyber event. All right, same with the special cause of loss exclusions there. This gets into a direct physical loss. Now, a direct physical loss, you have to understand that the term direct is a legal term. That is not our vernacular. It's not just how we would use the the word direct in normal conversation. So probably an easy way to explain this would be the following. If A leads directly to B, maybe there could be coverage for that. If A plus X leads to some sort of uh, direct physical loss, there might not be coverage for that. Once again, covered inside of my book, you'll get a, a link to it here shortly. And here you go. So the role of cyber insurance in all of this. Now, I would encourage every manufacturer out there to make sure you have an appropriate cyber insurance policy. It doesn't have to be through me. 
I cannot be everybody's insurance guy. However, I can try and educate the masses out there and all those manufacturing firms to make sure they understand really kind of what they at least need to look for. The problem with cyber insurance is that it's, well, it's very, very affordable, which is good for you. But on the insurance broker side, there's really not a lot of impetus to actually gain an expertise in cyber insurance unless you do a lot of it because there's really just no money in it. So for a you know, million dollar business, maybe they're paying a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars for their cyber insurance policy, and then that insurance broker makes fifty bucks a year before tax on that policy. Not a lot of impetus to really do a deep dive there. So if you want to look at it for yourself, this is damage control cyber insurance and compliance. That is where you can actually go and download it for free. If you want to buy it on Amazon, that'd be great to help support the cause as well. Now, with manufacturers, you guys tend to have really specific needs that you're not really going to see in other types of industries. So as we said before, you don't have a lot of PHI, PII, PCI. What does that really mean? You're not going to have a lot of breach notification letters probably go out the door. You're not going to have a lot of uh, you know, payment card reissuances, for example. You're probably just not going to have that stuff because you just don't have a lot of it. Now, of course, every business is unique. So let's go ahead and kind of go down this list here of things that I think every manufacturer should at least be asking about. On top of all the fundamental cyber coverages, um, obviously you can read about those in my book. So first and third party bodily injury and property damage. Generally, if you have people working beside machines or if you have machines um, that are actually attached to a network somehow, those machines could be potentially damaged. So all the other insurance policies that you could possibly have, there's likely going to be an exclusion in there for any type of malicious activity, so aka a data breach that leads to some sort of bodily injury or property damage. So if you have people working next to machines, machines attached to networks, those are two coverages I really think you need to take a hard look at or you could potentially be out a significant amount of money. Of course, business interruption, I think that's fairly self-evident having gone through this talk already. Dependent and contingent business interruption. So that could be if you guys have an MSP, you have an IT out there, or any other type of vendor you're relying on. And if they go down and you just can't make money, so it could also be a cloud provider where information is stored. If they just go down and you can't make money, you can't make whatever it is you're doing, then that would be a very, very useful coverage option for you. Obviously, social engineering, wire fraud, payment fraud, it comes through a million names. You really got to be careful. Please, please be careful when you're looking at that. All of those terms are different. There's a million options under the sun. Just because insurer A and insurer B both say social engineering coverage, those could be completely different coverages when you actually look at the definitions there. So read the definitions, do a tabletop exercise, figure out where those losses could be. Regardless, probably the most you're going to get there is going to be a quarter million without really kind of jumping through some hoops. And you have to work with someone who actually really understands this very, very particular niche of cyber insurance if you're going to get anything above a quarter million there. So, of course, work on those internal controls as well. That's going to be your first line of defense. Think of cyber insurance as a reserve parachute. You wouldn't just jump out of a plane with only a reserve chute on. You're going to want to have that primary chute, and that's going to be your defense in depth, specifically those other controls we already spoke about. Bricking coverage. That would be if somebody overwrites the instructions on some piece of hardware and that hardware can no longer work. Highly encourage you to think about that. And there's also now potentially coverage for contractual damages as well. So you'd have to look at what type of contracts you have in place, if there's some particular damage that could be awarded to a plaintiff in the event of some sort of breach. And finally, don't forget about those regulatory requirements. So obviously CMMC, I think everyone here is probably familiar with that, or at least you know if that applies to you or not. And then EO 13636, and that is Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity. That's been out since 2013. Uh, a whole bunch of particular issues in there, which I'm not going to delve in. That could be a video in and of itself. And there could be other regulatory issues you deal with as well. So, hey, maybe you are that manufacturer and you actually deal with credit cards, for example. And you could potentially fall under something called PCI DSS. Or maybe you're actually, you are intaking a lot of, say, social security numbers. And you could potentially fall under uh, some sort of FTC requirement or Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, etc. Make sure you actually understand 
what those regulatory requirements are. Because at the end of the day, when people come to me and they go, hey, what do I need to do for cybersecurity? The first thing I tell them is, one, I'm a cyber insurance guy. But two, having a master's in cybersecurity law, I will tell you, start with the things that are just absolutely required of your business to do. And then we can start talking about the things that would also be good to do. But if you're not meeting those regulatory requirements to begin with, you could be in some potential trouble there. All right, to wrap all this up, because I know we've been going on for about 20 minutes here, here's what you need to do. Work with your IT, work with your MSP. Those boundary defense, security awareness training, and data protection regimes, those were the three specific cybersecurity controls that we talked about previously. Don't forget defense in depth because there is no silver bullet, but you're going to want to work with those guys. Try and harden your system as much as is reasonably possible given the amount and type of information that your specific manufacturing business has. Of course, check your insurance policies. Please check your insurance policies, understanding what your particular risks could be. Also keep in mind, and this is just a brief side note, I have a whole other video on this, you don't necessarily want redundant coverages across multiple policies or you could end up paying multiple deductibles and that could kind of shock you. So please be aware of that. All right, finally, consider working with some sort of compliance expert or a qualified attorney to actually understand what your particular regulatory requirements could be. You can get a head start by taking out a, I'm sorry, checking out uh, my book, which you can find here. So once again, that was Damage Control Cyber Insurance Compliance. It's available for free as my computer freaks out. Right there, cplbrokers.com forward slash book two. With that, I hope you guys stay safe out there. If you enjoyed this or if you think that I missed something, please leave a comment below, like, share, and subscribe, etc. Stay safe.